I want to share with you a very little passage in the book of Jonah. You don't need to have it. I'll just read it to you. Uh, if I can find it in here. Um, So, because <clears throat> uh, Brocha told Yonah to go to Ninveh and he didn't want to do it, and for whatever reason, and he ended up on a ship to to Tarshish, and uh, there's a terrible storm, and the sailors were really wonderful people. They wanted to save him, him and them, all of them, in, in every possible way. Then they cast not, lots, and it turns out <coughs> that he's the one that the lots pick out. So, they say to him, um, please tell us, since you're the one who's bringing all this evil on us, because the lots picked him out. What is your work? Where are you coming from? What land is your land? And for what people are you? So first of all, they ask him four questions. And the first question is, what is your work? And I think this is as modern as today. Because if you were at a social gathering and you're introduced to a complete stranger, what is the first question that you would ask him? You would ask him, what is your work? Because that single question will give you more information about him than any other single question. You'll know about his education, you'll know about his economic bracket, you'll know something about his politics, you'll know a great deal from his work. People are characterized by their work, and they tend to identify with their work. Take a person and ask him, what are you? Instead of saying, human being or Republican, he'll say doctor or economist or football player or whatever. Yonah doesn't answer that question at all. So a lot to be learned from that fact. He doesn't answer that question at all. What does Yonah say? Every Anochi, that's my people. Of the four questions of identification, he only says, I'm an Ivri, I'm a Jew. And uh, I stand in awe of Hashem, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. So that's my spiritual identity. The other three questions he leaves un unanswered altogether. But the first, uh, the only one of the four that he answers is, what people are you from? I am an Ivri. I'm a Jew. Now, I put that into the context of what I said two minutes ago. So that means, for, for Yona, you want to know something about me, you want to know a fact about me that identifies more about me than any other possible fact? I'm a Jew. That's what I am. That's what I am. There are a lot of things that I do, but that's what I am. And what I am, being a Jew, is and I stand in awe of the Creator. Uh, you hear a lot about Jewish identity, and there are different groups, and they define Jewish identity in different ways. And here's a criterion for Jewish identity that I crafted. Imagine that for each person, there are two cameras tracking him, one external and one internal. External camera tracks what he does, and the internal tra camera tracks what he thinks, what he feels, his whole mental life. What percentage of the day could you tell 
that that person is Jewish by tracking the two commandments. There are people for whom the answer is 24 7, 365, without any doubt. Because either he's wearing some kind of Jewish garment, or he's engaged in some kind of direct Jewish activity, or when he isn't, he's adjusting what he's doing to his other, you know, I'm going to be studying for three hours. Why three hours? Because there's mincha after three hours. So I have to be available to have a mincha so I can only study for three hours. Or work. I'm working until four o'clock because four o'clock is when the shear is. We have a shear from four to five. So at four o'clock I close my business and I go to the shear. If you measure Jewish identity that way and count person hours of participation in Jewish identity, and I think you will get a very different me uh, metric for the amount of Jewish identity that various different Jewish groups possess. And I can leave your imagination to do the working out of the details as to which groups, whether they have more or less paid members, whether they have a stronger or weaker Jewish identity. This is what, this is Jonah's attitude. Jonah's attitude is, I'm a Jew. That means that all the other things about me, which particular profession I have, or which nusach I daven, you know, which particular sitter I use, and so on, are secondary. They might be part of my Jewish identity, but they're secondary. The fact that I am a Jew, a Jew, is what's primary. Now, <clears throat> as you go through life, and as you go through different activities in life, sometimes your primary identity is foremost, and sometimes it isn't. You know, when your child trips and has a skinned knee, it's because you're the father or you're the mother that you're doing that. And it's because you're a Jew. But there are many times in which the identity of being a Jew is foremost, and it's always playing a role. What do I do for my child who, who, uh, who sl 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 slipped and, and skinned her knee, knee? Well, I do X, Y, Z because I'm a Jew, and this is what Jews do. People are thinking now about the war that we're in and the atrocities that were committed last week and how to think about them, how to feel about them. And I think people have a wide variety of responses. And probably the vast majority of the responses are appropriate. I'm not here to say that, you know, there's only one way to deal with, uh, with the, the, the knowledge and uh, vicarious experience of these terrible atrocities. But I think that one has to respond as a Jew foremost. I think that's the foremost identity. I would take the, the key of this from, from prayer. It has been said many times by many people that the text of prayer, which we have from the Anshik Nesodola, the sages who were operating at the beginning of the Second Temple, that the text is all in the plural. No singular, singular self-reference there whatsoever. It's all uh, we and us. Yes, we are encouraged when we express a prayer for the we and us, if any one of us falls under that rubric, then he should have it himself in mind. Some say to say it out in words, some say to meditate on it. So if you are praying for, let's say, help in earning a living, and you have requests along that line, actually, actually everyone should have requests, but I'm not going to that right now. So it's we, the Jewish people, need support in earning a living. And ich bin Yankel, the Jew, and I also need support. But I come in only under the rubric of Jews need, and I'm a Jew. So, when we think about something like the atrocities of last week and the continuing danger that we're undergoing now, we have to try to think of it in more, in glo more global terms. <coughs> Not instead of, but in addition to, and perhaps primary, above and beyond, you know, personal terms, uh, which would divide me from other Jews. I live in Jerusalem, in the safety of Jerusalem. I have a child who lives 10 miles from Gaza, so uh, I'm worried about my child more than 
people whose children lived in, in places further than Gaza. What's going on with the Jewish people? First of all, suffering that comes to Jewish people comes for a variety of different reasons. And we have to wait for those who represent the generation as a whole to explain to us what the particular message of these sufferings is or what messages there are. Um, and I'm not one of them, so I can't even uh, dream of what they will say. But there are certain connections that are there, whether these are the ones that they would stress or not, I don't know, but they certainly are there to, to be considered. The fact that um, the attack took place on Simchas Torah, the culmination of the Avoda of Tishrei, the whole of Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Simchas Torah, building the spiritual platform from which to enter the next the new year, and it's based on self-examination and plans for uplifting the future and celebrating the first Baruch's kindness to us, to have that happen on that day has to make us think again, think again about the service that we did and the intentions that we had, the extent to which we, want, we went to examine whether maybe we were lax or too complacent or lazy or preoccupied to give it the, the strength and the focus that it required. And that means, again, globally, in other words, the, the, the Jewish people as a whole has to be a sense of those who live in Israel, those who live outside Israel, the way they interact with one another and interact as between the Jewish, the Israeli population and the Gola, the, the exiled population. Um, I think there has to be an examination of our feelings about kochi v'otzim yodi. Kochi v'otzim yodi means the things that I, that I have been involved in and which turned out well did so because of my power and my strength. That's why they turned out that way. Because I made them turn out that way. I'm in control. I have power. I'm the one who's doing it. Now, Rav Desta stresses that uh, you have to distinguish between two levels. One is the true-false answer to the questions for, on, the, on the philosophy exam. Who's running the world? You or God? Oh, I know the answer to that one. God. Check that one off. And so forth and so on. Yeah, I know which answers to check off. The question is, how do I feel? What's my reaction to world events? What's my reaction to the things that happen in Israel, outside of Israel? How do I judge other people? Uh, do I really see and experience God's hand in everything that happens? And do I take that seriously? Gee, you know, we had a very sophisticated sen offense between us and Gaza. With all sorts of monitoring equipment and uh, uh, sensors planted deep in the ground to make tunnels impossible, and automatic machine gun nests where they, where they could be fired by remote control so no person's life was in danger. And we have extensive um, spiring in, in Gaza. Local hires were paid off Hundreds of them to give us information about what's going on. That's how we can keep ahead of the plans of Hamas and others. And we have uh, military experts and military psychologists who analyze the psychology of, of, of Hamas and others and, and lead us to know what to expect. Um, gee, all of that failed us. All of it. All of it. Not just one chink here and there. Not just should have been at 95%, it was only at 85%. No, total failure. Total failure. Maybe some of us were trusting it too much. Maybe we became complacent because we thought 
Well, it's standing there. All these clever technologists and all these dedicated soldiers and so on and so on are standing there. They have it under control. After all, they fought four wars against Hamas, five wars against Hamas. And although there were missiles and so on and so on, still we always retained control, we always retained, retained our, our, our general safety. Yeah, we're doing pretty well. And we have it pretty much under control. We understand, we have, as I was told that in the last few years, more and more forces were withdrawn from Gaza because there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to, to be concerned about. We know that they don't want full-scale conflict. We know that they're, uh, they're afraid of it. They lost out so badly before. All the stories, all the stories could not possibly have gotten it more wrong. So maybe, of course, none of us was responsible for these things. We weren't sitting in the high, in the high command deciding what to do. But to what extent were we also trusting that they had it under control? We're all praying for the safety of the soldiers. Vision to Rebbe, Sadi Mishaberach, for the safety of the soldiers. Asking divine help, divine protection, that they should be safe. And we all echo that. To what extent is our focus, our hope, our dream that this military operation, if it takes place, results in a sanctification of the divine name. What would that mean? Have we thought about it? Or are we thinking about killing all those terrorists and ridding them of their, of their military means and rendering the place uh, harmless to us and so forth and so on? What about sanctification of God's name? Is that a topic that's come up? what we should hope for. Suppose there is a tremendous military victory and the attitude of people afterwards is, well, the IDF did well. They re recovered their good name. They really are the top army of the Middle East. Yes, we can trust. Yes, we can trust them. Uh -huh. Have we learned anything? If trusting them before was wrong, trusting them that in victory is also wrong. It's also wrong. Don't want to trust them. Now, let's be careful. There's a famous verse that everybody knows. Or hagever sheyiftach badam. Cursed is the person, the man who trusts in man. The Rashba and the and the Avram and the Rambam quotes his father, the Rambam, as saying the following. You have to read the verse to the end. It says, Curses is the one who trusts a man, and he removes his trust from God. And they both say, we have only the Rambam's son as his, as his, as his uh, witness. They say, is it forbidden to trust your parents? Is it forbidden to trust your siblings, your teachers, your loved ones? Is it forbidden to trust? What? You know, nobody's saying, cursed it is someone who trusts any other person. Certainly not. Certainly it's appropriate to trust other people. Just remember that your ultimate trust is in Hashem, and that only He can guarantee any, any particular outcome. And if they are there and they help you, you have to thank Hashem for giving you such wonderful people to be there for you. That's the prohibition. Well, when we think, yeah, the IDF is clever, they've got everything under control, they know how to do it, and so forth and so on, is it followed by, and Baruch Hashem, that he's giving them wisdom, and he's directing them, and he's making them sensitive to the things that have to be known, because without a Kodesh Baruch Hu's direction, they wouldn't succeed. Is that thought also there? Is that thought primary? Is it the thought you check off on the philosophy exam? Or is it in your, in your consciousness? And you feel that warm sense of, of peace, knowing that the IDF is there to, to protect you. Is it even warmer for a Kodesh Baruch Hu, who is making the IDF 
capable of doing those things. So maybe if we are envisioning the hoped for victory, we have to envision that it should happen in such a way that it would generate in people's minds that it's Kukhaj Baruch's victory. I was here right after the 67 war for, uh, for, for nine weeks. And the country, of course, was euphoric. It was the greatest victory in the whole 20th century. And people were talking about miracles and so forth and so on. Six years later was the, was the Yom Kippur War, which was a terrible disaster. Six years later, hello, did the military balance turn upside down in six years? Did suddenly the Arabs get such better uh, uh, materials and such better strategy and so forth and so on? Many said, the Sixth Day War was a test. Will you get the message or won't you? Will you understand that you had a victory far, far in excess of anything you could have dreamt of? Well, they, they had drug anticipatory um, graves in 67, tens of thousands of graves. As I remember it, the sum total uh, uh, number of casualties was, was like 750. It was spectacularly more successful than they could possibly have expected. Did they see it as a divine gift? Well, to, um, just to a little calculation, if, say, six years later, it was a disastrous defeat. Oh, yes, we won it eventually, but in three weeks, 2,500 soldiers were killed. And we took uh, the, the Barlev line, like the Maginot line of the French, uh, which was supposed to hold the, the Nile and make it impossible, the Suez Canal, and make it impossible to, to cross. They crossed it and conquered it and chased us back. Did anybody get it? You guys say, wait a minute, hello. If that's what happened in six years, then it wasn't us. It wasn't us. And this is the anniversary of the, the Yom Kippur War. And people were talking about it at the anniversary. This is the some civil total war. So I think we have to meditate as a, as a nation and ask ourselves, what lesson are we supposed to learn from this? I was in a taxi today, and the taxi cab driver was talking about his wife who's making food for the army. My, my wife and I said, that's, that's wonderful. We, we, she was trying to do it also, was trying to get in touch with people for whom we already contributed food for people who came around collecting food for the army, you know? Everybody's behind it. The, 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 the um, call-up has been 150% effective. 50% more came than were, were called up. People are volunteering all over. The, uh, the, the country is galvanized. There's no, no question about that. But where's the Kodesh Baruch in all this? Where, where's, where's the role that he's playing? Our job, because Rova says, Atem Eda, you are my witnesses in the world, in the world, in the world. And if we're waving the Kochri Yadi flag, the my strength and my power made this happen. If we're waving that flag, it's a terrible, terrible disaster. It's a terrible failure. We have to think and act in such a way that this dimension becomes a paramount dimension. My youngest son has a program that he's been running for more than 20 years for the army, for groups in the army, where he provides um, education for them and sometimes entertainment for them. And, and he goes around, there's been thousands of soldiers. Um, it started 20 years ago, whatever, whichever war that was, and he decided to provide soldiers with tzitzes. And he got people to donate money. He procured thousands of tzitzes. He went from base to base. Offered to anybody. And he said, you know, there's a guy there with no kippah. And he wants tzitzes. He's going into battle. He wants tzitzes. He's just doing it now. Um, so these soldiers know, and he's a chassidisha, like I am, only he wears his pants down. <laughs> they know the so Hasidic guy is coming, providing them, coming, wishing them well, praying for them, davening for them. That's a way of showing solidarity. I just heard now that a thousand people in the Haredi communities asked to be used. 
to do something for the war. Okay, they're not trained to shoot guns, they're not going to shoot guns, but they can cook food, they can deliver mail, they can drive trucks, they, whatever they could do uh, to help. So they're carrying with them this attitude that we're not just shooting bullets. There's a perennial uh, disagreement in this country about whether yeshiva people should be in the army. And one of the arguments is that whether the army wins the war depends upon the spiritual status of the Jewish people who are here. And we're contributing to that. And if you ask us to serve in the army, you're asking us to do double duty. And then the ironical response is, if you're prepared to send all of your people to Yeshiva for two years, we'll also join the army for two years. Then everybody in the country will be spending time in Yeshiva, and everybody in the country will be spending time in the army. Everybody will be bearing the double burden, but it's not appropriate that we should bear a double burden when everybody else is bearing a, a single burden. Rehaim Shmuel Levitz, that war, said, there are two things that you have to, have to be, uh, keep in mind. Now, he said it on one level, but it's applicable on many levels. The level that he said it on was, he was the mashkech of the Mir Yeshiva. He said, the outcome of the war is being decided in the base medrash. That's where the determination is being made whether you should win the war or lose the war. And the soldiers who are fighting if they're killed, they are great kedoshim. They are great holy people whose souls will be in the highest level of the world to come. It's quite difficult psychologically to hold in mind two ideas, that the real outcome is being determined over here and the people over there are holy people and have to be treasured. They have to be precious because of their holiness. They're both true. And it's easy to latch onto one and de-emphasize de 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 or degrade the other. And one mustn't, mustn't do that. So one has to show that we as a people appreciate. We uh, feel, respond in love and in awe to the sacrifices and efforts that are made by those who are actually putting themselves in straightforward danger. Um, with the missiles, everybody's in some danger. And on the other hand, realize that what we are doing is the fulcrum of the decision. It's where Kodesh Baruch looks to see whether the outcome should be one way or the other. Um, and that it depends, in, in, to a great extent, I think, in how we understand and how we experience what's going on here. Um, Jews were slaughtered. This is called, in, in our literature, Achil Hashem, that these people who are God's representatives in the world are being treated this way is a desecration of God's name. Yeah, there's, it's a pasuk with Katzol Tevich Yuval that's describing slaughters of Jews in past history, that they, went like, they were being taken like sheep to the slaughter. You've heard that phrase from certain different, different types of groups with different types of ideas. <coughs> I never dreamt that I would see it again. Never. So I think, in my own thinking, why not? Why not? It's a pasuk of King David. It happened over and over and over again from the Babylonians to the Romans to the pogroms of the Middle Ages. Slaughter. Slaughter. Look at the Tochacha and Kisavo. Absolutely. Why did I think that that would never happen again? Because because we have such a strong army. Could never happen again. Was that my thinking? One of the leftist historians, I heard him on the radio, said, this is the failure of the Zionist dream. The Zionist dream was, this will never happen again. A pogrom? There'll never be another pogrom. Never. We will defend ourselves. And that's finished. That history is finished. Really? Really? But no. No. Pogrom here in Israel. The worst pogrom. Women, children, beheadings, burnings. A straightforward pogrom. Sometimes people ask, with all the suffering of the Jewish people, how can you possibly believe the Torah is true? Take out Deuteronomy chapter 28 
and read to them the predictions of what can happen, which in some respects go beyond anything that ever happened. I say, you may not like what the Torah says, but the idea of Jews suffering being an objection to its truth, on the contrary, on the contrary, the Torah is very realistic, very realistic about things that have happened. So even I was lulled into that sense of, false sense of security, that, well, that's not going to happen again. Um, the recovery of the, the Jewish perspective of the Jewish people as a whole is something which we have to work on as a, as a people as a whole. Then I was speaking to my Rebetzin this morning about, I didn't see the pictures, but I read the descriptions of what happened. And they're, they're haunting. The idea of a pogrom, a real pogrom, just slaughtering Jews in cold blood. Um, and the Rebetzin remind me of what our perspective is on these things. You know, uh, First of all, it's not spiritually productive to think in terms of the evil of those people. They're evil, period, capital E. Okay, done. A soul comes into this world to achieve something, and there are many opportunities. Reincarnation is a Jewish belief, and if it doesn't achieve it in one uh, appearance in the world, it appears achieve it in other appearances in the world. And the experiences that it has depend both on its choices in this life and also the potential and needs of the soul that it's carrying, which has been here in other lives. And it is impossible for us to understand what these events mean to a soul. Similar idea, not as extreme, but a similar idea um, I guess it was in the 50s when it was just becoming possible to do some uh, invest, uh, observation of the, of the embryo and to pick up possibly certain problems the embryo might have and whether that should lead to an abortion. Rav Moshe Feinstein said, was asked the question whether that's appropriate or not. Now, his chubas are long and complex and, and argued on the highest level of Talmud Torah. I'm not, I'm not commenting on any of that. But he did make one philosophical remark. He said, what are you doing when you look at an, at, an, at an embryo and you see that it's going to have a certain disability and you decide to abort? What you're saying is bringing that embryo into the world with a Jewish soul isn't worth it. Isn't worth it. Isn't worth what? Well, it isn't worth having that child with its soul in the world. Really? How could you make that judgment? How could you know that? Well, but I won't go mountain climbing with him or her. Or I won't uh, discuss poetry with him and her. Oh, really? And that's your problem? That's what you're thinking about? Gee, I thought that the Creator played some role in our thinking. What about that? Maybe that child with his or her limitations, and even, God forbid, a, lot, a short lifespan. Maybe that's what that soul needs. And you can facilitate for that soul what that soul needs. Let me ask you a, a, um, a question which seems to be unrelated, but you'll see that it, that's connected. What would you say about a person who dies before the age of 40? Before the age of 40. Wouldn't you think that that's tragedy. He died before the age of 40. Probably you know, didn't see grandchildren, or very few. Didn't see any grandchildren married, for sure. Okay, the Arizal and the Ramchal both died before the age of 40. Do you think their lives were tragically short? That they sort of let self so, uh, lives to be pitied because it was so short? Somehow that thought doesn't come up, does it? Yeah, but the Arizal, you know. Ramchal. <laughs> what they accomplished in less than 40 years, 
It would take me a thousand years to accomplish, and I wouldn't be able to do it in a thousand years. Surely I can't think of their lives as tragic. Okay, what about somebody else who isn't the Arizal? It isn't the Ramchal, and dies before 40. Maybe he accomplished everything he needs to accomplish. That's why Akkadosh Baruch Hu put him in the world, to do that. Maybe his soul was here, Gabriel said, but all repeats. Maybe his soul was here six times, and this is what was nef- left necessary to complete his position, his, his, his uh, shlemus and all this. And the same is true with shorter lives, and the same is true with lives with, with pain or loss. It's, you know, the gadol alai, we say in Hebrew. It's too big for me to make a judgment like that, that it wasn't worth it. That it should have been otherwise. Am I really running the universe? So there's a sense in which when you put into the, put, put the, the events into a bigger picture and you acknowledge that a Kodesh Baruch was running the world, you're not overwhelmed and devastated by them. Rabbi Yochanan comforted mourners by bringing with him a bone from the tenth child of his who died. He lost 10 children. He was the editor of the Talmud Yerushalmi. First generation of, of Amaroyim, one of the greatest we ever had. He suffered a lot, buried 10 children. And yet, he was. The greatness that he was. So, he too, how did he look at it? One of the Gera Rebbe's, I forget which one, lost a 27-year-old son. And when they came to comfort him, one of the things he said to people was, you're trying to comfort me for all the years I didn't have with him. I'm thankful for the 27 years that I did have. Really? Hmm. Who thinks of that? This is the father not somebody outside who's less connected. Who thinks of that? That's putting a Kodesh Baruch Hu back in the picture. So if we st- step back from the visceral, visceral attitudes, and we, and we put a Kodesh Baruch Hu back in the picture, we can look at, we can look at it in, somewhat, in, in a different way, in a way that's less unhinged, less devastating and less psychologically dangerous and certainly less philosophically dangerous. Um, is there a goal of destroying Hamas? Is a goal of making them pay for that evil? There's a goal of sanctifying God's name in the world. And if that will lead to a sanctification of God's name, yes, absolutely. And if not, and if viscerally, I feel they deserve it. I hope they get it. That's true, but it's a spiritual sellout. It's a spiritual failure. We have to struggle to keep a Kodesh Baruch Hu in mind, to keep our focus on the Kodesh Baruch Hu as a nation. Now, I say as a nation because not only is it a lesson for me, but it's a lesson for the people around me. Those are people that I, that I talk to, and for you also, to the people you talk to, the way you, the way you express yourself, to your children, if you have children, especially, they're looking at you. They're looking at you to see, what does this mean? How do we respond? How do we deal with it? I had a boy from a Flum family who went off. His parents got in touch, and he came over and came to philosophical battle and so on. But I, I checked, I asked, has this boy been through any trauma? And the parents said, no. Father's a doctor. He said, no. Someone did a little background check for me, found out that he had a sibling who died of cancer. The sibling had the, had the, the cancer, and then there was remission. And of course, the whole community was davening for the, for the sibling. And then it came back, and he died. And the father told me, no, he's never been through a trauma. 
What does that mean? It means the father is not dealing with it. And the child knows his father is not dealing with it. So he looks at him. He says, child! He says, what kind of system is this? You can't deal with it? You can't, you're a doctor? And you're, you're, you believe in the Torah? You believe in God? And you can't deal with it? Why should I be part of a system like that? And he's so self-deluded, he could tell me that there was no trauma. So we have to, that's, that's the extent to which the, the delusion can go. I have to be very, very careful about that kind of self-delusion. And then the parallel story to that, another family, I think the doctor, his family uh, in that case was a doctor also. And uh, the boy went off, and he was in university. <coughs> and he told his father, the reason why he left Yiddishkeit is because of Gödel's theorem, of which I'm sure none of you have ever heard. Gödel was a great mathematical logician, maybe the greatest of the 20th century. And just so happens, I wrote my doctoral thesis on that theorem. So I said, send it to me. And he came, and he said, and I said, well, how do you get to abandoning the Torah because of Gertelsen? So he tried to tell me a story. I said to him, tell me, Gertelsen, what does it say, and how is it proved? Well, he was pretty spotty on it. And I said to him after an hour, listen, you like cheeseburgers, you like snorkeling on Shabbos, you like leftist politics, be honest. You don't want to be from because it's not giving you the things that you enjoy, things that you like, or things you value. But don't pretend that it's girdles there. You know, that's stupid. <laughs> Anybody who knows it will think that you're, you're just hopeless. He did it because that way he had leverage over his father. You don't have to hurt a girl, have you? Ah, you're in the ravis. I know better than you do. Although, it was just a, it was just a bluff. There's a lot of bluffing going on. There's a lot of self-deception going on. A lot of short-sightedness going on. I'll give you one more example, and then I think I'm going to quit. Um, I have a shear which you can look up called uh, From God's Point of View. But here's one example. Um, let's suppose that I have decided to work on my hospitality. And I decided that Friday night when uh, I'm in shul, I'm going to look around and see if there's anybody there who I don't know, someone who's not part of the community, and I'll offer that person hospitality. Fine. It's Friday night. I'm saying, Baruch Hu, we're sitting down to start at my riff, and I see him. There he is in the corner. Ha! He's definitely not part of our community. Okay, just wait for my riff to be over. He's my guest. My riff is over. I don't alarm. I get up. I start walking to the corner. But, Ruvain, Ruvain is two steps ahead of me, and he, he, he seems to be going in. No. He couldn't be going to the corner to the, to the stranger. He walks up to the stranger. Hello, but I don't know you. Are you new? And Yeah, I happen to be traveling through. Do you have a place to stay? Oh, no, I don't. Could, uh, would you join me for Shabbos? I'd love to join you. And they walk off together. How do I feel? I feel devastated. Ruvain stole my guest. He stole my guest. Now, ask yourself, how does the Kosh Baruch feel? Well, Ruvain offered hospitality, and the guest got his hospitality. And I wanted to do the mitzvah, so I got credit for doing the mitzvah, even though I wasn't able to do it. So for a Kodesh Baruch, it was a win-win-win situation. Why am I upset? I'm upset because I'm not looking at it with a Kodesh Baruch Hu's view. Oh, hmm, that makes a difference, to see it the way a Kodesh Baruch Hu sees it, rather than the way I see it. I see it as, at best, my spiritual development in my hospitality, or a certain spiritual pride, or ego, or worse. I'm not looking at it the way the Kodesh Baruch Hu looks at it. That's the challenge. The challenge is, what is the Kodesh Baruch Hu evaluating? How is he looking at it? What does he want to happen? And maintaining our understanding that he's running what's going on at all times. <sighs> yes. I have to think in terms of the am, what the am needs, what role we can play as part of the am. And Kodesh Baruch Hu should enable us to learn the lesson from these events so that in the future, Nitz Hashem, we can learn lessons from different kinds of events.
more simcha that you get. We talk about chasadim tovim in the Shema Netzvah. Good loving kindnesses. Is there any other kind? And the answer is that everything is chesed. But some things will lead to a chesed outcome. And some things are chesed immediately. That's why Nocha Mishkamzu says, Gamzu le tova. This too is for good. Rabbi Kiva said, Everything does is for good. Not everything is good at the moment and good in and of itself. Some things are only good in terms of the consequences they will bring to. We have to make this terrible tragedy into a litova. And Dam to Kodesh Baruch Hu, that the other chasadim that he has in store for us will be tova, straight, tova simplicity, just tova.